Dear students, welcome to this course on my lecture on environmental legislation in India. I am Dr. P. Saktivel. I am working with the Tamil Nadu Dr. Ambedkar Law University. This lecture is about environmental legislation. So, what is environmental legislation? It's a broader term used to refer laws relating to environment, including pollution control, waste management, resource protection, and conservation. It includes urban land regulation, waste disposal, and development laws, which are also intrinsically connected to environmental laws. Agriculture, food, transportation laws also have close association with the working of environmental laws because food production is something essential to human life and transportation has become indispensable in our day-to-day -day activities. So, they are also closely related to environmental legislation, how do they operate and so on. Now, you can extend environmental legislation or the scope of environmental legislation to global issues such as climate change. Uh, that is the nature of environmental legislation, that is what it contains. And what is the background of environmental legislation, that is the legal background of environmental legislation, how did they come into existence? That is the basis. They emerged from constitutional obligations. So, what is constitution? Constitution is the fundamental law of the land and international commitments. India has committed and countries have committed amongst themselves to protect environment because it is a global issue. So, therefore, we have got international commitments. We have got many court cases judgments of higher courts such as Supreme Court and High Courts, they consistently state that uh, these are the obligations, these are the constitutional obligations that the state has to fulfill. Therefore, laws are being enacted, although it is the direction, not uh, merely in the, direct, in the context of direction, uh, the state uh, is obliged to do it. Uh, and then, through various studies conducted by the government and other agencies, including the academic agencies. In fact, in the context of studies, the work of NGOs play a vital role, which is uh, relevant for our course. And they are expanded by the interpretive judgments of various courts, and rules are often made by government and other authorities to implement these laws. So, this is what environmental legislation contains. Although it is we talk about legislative text, we also include in the study about all these elements, aspects. So, and then uh, constitutional basis extends or emanates from Article 39B, which states that material resources of the community are to be distributed to best to subserve the common good. Now, now, what are material resources? All natural resources are material resources. So, they have to be uh, distributed in such a way to benefit the entire population. So, that entire national population, that is how we need to see it. And now, we have got two articles being inserted, that is Article 48A and Article 51A, 51A. Both of them got inserted by Constitutional Amendment, 42nd Amendment. So, this Article 48A is amended, amending the directive principles of state policy. 51AG is amended through the or inserted through fundamental duties. So, what is the directive principle under Article 48A? It says that the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forest and wildlife of the country. So, what is state here? State means government, legislature and all the local authorities. So, all of them got a mandate from the constitution to protect the environment and forest. And second, uh, Article 51 AG, which interests a duty upon every citizen, that it is a duty of, upon the citizens to protect and improve the natural environment, including forest, lakes, rivers and wildlife, and to have compassion for all the living creatures. So, these are the mandates from the constitution. Now, we will look into the constitutional basis, that is, India is a federal country, 
whereas uh, powers to legislate is distributed amongst state and union governments. Therefore, we will see uh, what are the powers of the state, what are the powers of the union and what are in the concurrent powers. So, the state has got the primary or the original role in terms of protecting the environment or the valuable resources that we have including water, land, fisheries, regulation of mines and minerals and industries. In fact, some of these subjects such as uh, industries or regulation of mines are subject to certain powers of the union government or the union parliament. Now, union government or the parliament has got wider powers in terms of national interest. So, uh, first we will see that uh, certain aspects such as maritime shipping which is essentially a subject connected to international relations or the connecting the coast of almost all states. Therefore, it comes within the framework of union government or the parliament and shipping and navigation, lighthouses, major ports uh, because it also involves uh, a, a level of taxation and import and export. So, major ports to be managed by the parliament or the governed by the parliament, aircrafts or airways and also oil fields, minerals and uh, very important uh, mines or important minerals are to be governed by, by the laws enacted by parliament. Whereas concurrent list facilitates both states and par parliament to legislate in many subjects because electricity is a need at the, to be disposed at the local level. Whereas you need coordination amongst all the agencies at the, at the national level. Therefore, both state and union governments have power over uh, power to legislate over electricity, newspaper, books, archaeological sites, acquisition of property. So, in all these you will understand there are such subjects, such number of subjects that are connected to environment dealt in in the constitution of India. And now we will see how these environmental laws work in practice or it is how the government machinery or the state machinery is working with the environmental laws. Now we will see the forest for forest and wildlife. The institutions are mainly managed by the government and there are certain statutory authorities. For Environment Protection Act under the Act, governments of the both state and union government play a vital role in rule making. And there are many authorities created under this uh, Environment Protection Act. They also play an important role in governing the rules and regulations as well as the law under the Environment Protection Act. As far as pollution is concerned, pollution control boards play a, play a vital role. Pollution control board plays a vital role, both state and uh, central pollution control board. And governments also play a vital role in uh, abating pollution through various regulations and government policies and mechanisms. As far as climate change is concerned, it is primarily an obligation vested with the government. We are yet to make stronger legislative framework for regulating the climate change. And for adjudication, that is if there is any dispute, where will you go? That is what adjudication is. Primarily National Green, you will find out National Green Tribunal has got in almost in every subject matter for forest, wildlife, environment protection, pollution control, in almost all environment related matters, you will find the jurisdiction of national green tribunals. Also in forest and wildlife, you will find out certain uh, municipal, uh, certain local courts, uh, including criminal courts, will have jurisdiction or issues to deal with. Whereas uh, in my, under the Environment Protection Act, you will find out higher courts including Supreme Court and High Courts dealing with certain issues of environment whenever there is a lacuna and so on. There you will find out the intervention of the uh, High Courts and as well as Supreme Court. And pollution also similarly you will find out uh, the role of higher courts uh, in, in, in terms of intervening in many aspects. Originally National Green Tribunal has also got a wider jurisdiction. 
and for climate change although national green tribunal preferred climate change in few cases it has not been given a very clear mandate to deal with issues in relation to climate change whereas the same applies to high court and supreme court also high courts and supreme courts also now we we'll look into the role of various agencies in environmental protection especially the government because government has got the larger obligation under many laws to protect environment so we'll see the role of government first one is law making that is the primary function of the legislature and the governance that is the primary function of the government agencies uh, and there are many institutions agencies authorities created for governing various aspects of environment government also ensures inter agency and intra agency cooperation what is this inter agency and intra agency cooperation there is a need for cooperation amongst many many authorities that are functioning in the same government for instance electricity authority may have certain priorities such as tamil nadu electricity board or some other electricity board may have certain priorities that may conflict with the forest department so it is the duty of the government to see that these agencies cooperate in in environmental matters similarly within the agency within the same agency there may be a need for cooperation and it is the duty of the government to ensure such a cooperation and the state government ensures implementation of its laws and policies various policies they have to consistently promote research and for which they have to fund it that is what governments are doing and dissemination of knowledge and awareness awareness about especially subjects such as this environmental awareness is something very much essential for the population therefore the government is consistently asked by various agencies on its own also government is disseminating knowledge relating to environment now we'll see what are the other groups interested in environmental governance especially in today's context we see the role of non governmental agencies you see that there are many groups referred here all these groups are mentioned in agenda 21 and agenda 21 is one of the important international instrument in relation to environmental protection or the future of the globe and these groups mentioned in agenda 21 continue to be uh, in existence continue to uh, be mentioned in almost all subsequent instruments therefore these groups are important or the importance of these groups are always recognized or stressed upon so what are they business and industry children and youth farmers indigenous peoples and their communities local authorities who are local authorities the local government panchayat municipalities corporations and so on non governmental organizations you know what is that scientific and technology community women workers and trade union and you'll be surprised to know for each of these categories there is an extensive research or extensive work is done on the on the role of these communities or these groups in relation to the protection of environment now we'll start with the uh, principles of environmental law the public trust doctrine public trust doctrine deals about the rights of the sovereign over natural resources these rights are actually the rights of a trustee it has been said by professor sachs in an article the uh, that uh, the us courts are following this principle which has been acknowledged in mc mehta versus kamal nath too whereas the court said indian courts has said the state is the trustee of all natural resources which are by nature meant for public use and enjoyment the state as a trustee is under a legal duty to protect the natural resources why are they protecting it because it is required for the future generations so we don't we can't exhaust all the resources available here we have to keep some of them or we have to keep maintain as it is for the future generation that is what public trust doctrine is about now we we'll look into sustainable development which is a broad, broader idea and doctrine recognized from the bradland report 
Redland is a diplomat who prepared this document. Therefore, it is called under his army's name. The, actually, the document is titled as Our Common Future uh, from the United Nations World Commission on Environment and Development, which was published in 1987. And it defines sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, the report further says that, or now the report shifted the focus more on economic development, social development, and environmental development, environmental protection for future generations. This publication, Our Common Future, and the work of the World Commission. Uh, has become a founding, foundation stone for Agenda 21 and the upcoming conferences that were held. And now the precautionary principle. Precautionary principle is basically, basically an approach that whenever you deal with a project, a future a project, you have to be cautious towards uh, the damages or the environmental um, calamities that may occur due to that project and that is what precautionary principle is and this principle is being declared in Rio declaration whereas it is stated that in order to protect the environment the precautionary approach shall be widely applied by states according to their capabilities where there are threats or serious or irreversible damage lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost effective measures to prevent environmental degradation so environmental uh, degradation should be prevented and this is what being laid down in precautionary principle now as a matter of expanding precautionary principles these are the guidelines one is environmental measures by the state government and the local authority must anticipate prevent and attack the causes of environmental degradation where there are threats of serious and irreversible damage Lack of scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing measures to prevent environmental degradation. So, at any cost, you have to start preventing envi environmental degradation. We can't say that uh, scientific, uh, scientific uncertainty is not there. And the onus of proof is on the actor of the developer to prove that this action is environmentally good. Polluters pay principle. The polluter's pay principle is advocated to make the polluter responsible for producing pollution and they will be responsible for paying the damage done to the natural environment. In India, this principle has been recognized through judgment law as well as in the National Green Tribunal Act. The Act says that, Section 20, which says that the tribunal shall, while passing any order or decision or award, apply this principle so it uh, it has been stated in rio declaration also our principle 16 states that national authorities should endeavor to promote the internalization of environmental cost and the use of economic instruments taking into account the approach that the polluter should in principle bear the cost of pollution so it has been repeatedly said that the polluter has to pay for the damages caused to environment by his actions or her actions. Now, this polluter pay principle also envisage another thing. There is an absolute liability that is a complete liability on the harm to the environment. Uh, whatever uh, harm that is being caused by the polluter, it has to be compensated uh, to the victims as well as natural environment. So, all the remediation measures against the degradation must be done by the polluter. It has been held in Indian Council for Environmental Legal Action versus Union of India and said by the Supreme Court. Now, the next thing is intergenerational equity. What is intergenerational equity? Whatever we have got, whatever the, future, the previous generations have got in terms of enjoying the natural landscape, using the rivers, or whatever the natural resources, whatever the benefits they got from the environment, that should be passed on to the future generations also. And it has been stated in many instruments, international instruments such as uh, 1972 UN Declaration as well as in many Supreme Court judgments. And it has been referred in many conventions also, 
international conventions which are mentioned here apart from Rio Declaration. Now, what is the influence of international community in making environmental laws? There are many conferences being held and at least once in 10 years you will find out a conference and some of these conferences have contributed significantly to what we have as international environmental law or international environmental governance. So their contribution is significant. All these conferences that you see here, the 1972 UN Conference on Human Environment, Nairobi, World Commission on Environment and Development, UN Conference on Environment and Development 1992, and a General Assembly Special Session, World Summit on Sustainable Development 2002 and 2012. So these conferences played a very critical role in our understanding of the global environmental governance. And contribution is of these conferences, it has prepared, a, we have got a global policy for environmental governance and developing an international legal framework. And there is international cooperation over environmental matters, which states often have a lot of issues with the other states, whereas environmental issues are common for all the states. Therefore, there is a need to cooperate, which states have understood through these conferences at least to some extent, if not the fullest extent, at least to some extent they have understood. And they agree on common principles or so the general principle that we have dealt like polluters pay or uh, there is under are other concepts also. So improving institutional capacity, there are global institutions are being created for environmental governance, exchange of in information or uh, sharing knowledge, sharing research for all. For all. Now there are institutional capacities being strengthened and funding is also provided. Inclusiveness. Now these conferences include almost all stakeholders from farmers to trade unions to non-governmental organizations. All are having one way or, an one way or another. They are having something to do with this in these conferences or they share their opinion whenever these conferences are being held. So how is it different from other international conferences on other subject matters? Generally, international law is created by states and in international environmental law also, international environmental governance is also primarily taken care by the nation states, that is uh, countries. Whereas in international environmental law or environmental governance, you see these agencies, these uh, stakeholders, from NGOs to other uh, trade unions or women, all of them have a role to play or all of them have something to say in these conferences, even if it, it can be an agitation or something of that sort. Now we'll come to uh, Indian laws because we refer to international environmental law or international environmental regime. Um, for the simple reason that our pollution control, our environmental protection laws are inspired by international regime. So therefore, we need to look, at, you know, therefore we have seen what international uh, governance of environment is. Now this, there are, uh, from 1974, we started regulating uh, pollution. Uh, even before we had certain enactments, but they are all, uh, they are all part of some other legislation. So now we started legislating on pollution control or environment only from 1974 very specifically. And you will see that 1974 is very close to 1972 when the Stockholm Declaration or Stockholm Conference was held. And then the Water uh, Prevention and Control of, control of uh, Pollution Cess Act 1977, the Air Act 1981 and finally the Environment Protection Act 19. 86. Now, in our segment, we will be seeing the Environment Protection Act 1986 with little more detail. This is an umbrella legislation. So, what is this umbrella? Under this legislation, under Environment Protection Act, you have many rules and regulations governing many aspects of environment. Whereas, Water Act dealt with water pollution, Air Act dealt with air pollution. But Environment Act, now you see you, you are regulating coastal regula coast, you are regulating waste management. So that is the broader uh, canvas under which Environment Protection Act works. That's why you call it as umbrella legislation. So the act empowers and also creates many authorities. This enactment facilities regulation of any aspect under the 
product term environment as I told you. So now there are uh, we also see the definitions of environment by which uh, the regulation is easier. Now you see the definition of environment which is also very close to the dictionary definition. At times you see the legal definitions are slightly different from the dictionary meaning. But in this case, you will find out the definition of environment is very close to the meaning given in the dictionary. And similarly, environment pollution and environment pollutant, all of them are similar to the dictionary meanings. Now, what can be regulated through this act? This act, uh, through this act, can regulate, uh, that means the government, governments, can regulate standards of quality of air, water, soil or for various areas and purposes, the maximum allowable limits of concentration of various environmental pollutants including noise for different areas, the procedures and safeguards for the handling of hazardous substances and the prohibition and restrictions on the handling of hazardous substances, prohibition and restriction on the location of industries, the procedures and safeguards for the prevention of accidents and there are bunch of rules made under this act to govern waste management. So you will find out uh, plastic waste management rules 2016, e-waste management rules, biomedical waste management rules, construction, hazardous and other substances with management and transboundary rules, solid waste management, battery waste management. We will be seeing now. Now, there is something important about these rules. These rules are uh, amended or changed often. When I say often, it means once in three years or four years, you will find out new set of rules. You will find out new amendment. So whenever you want to understand these rules, you need to look into the current rules that are prevailing and you can very well refer it from the website of the ministry. Now, we'll start with the solid waste management rules. Solid waste management rules are comprehensive, the current rules are comprehensive and it says that it, it, something, it says something about extended producer responsibility which you see here. You will see that extended producer responsibility in almost all waste management rules that we are going to see now. Now the rules say that, uh, rules provide various duties upon various ministries. So this Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change being extended by setting up a central monitoring committee. And fertilizers, Department of Fertilizer is asked to extend market development. And Ministry of Agriculture is asked to do about compost. And Ministry of Power is asked to take the, purchase the power from the energy plants that are uh, a part of solid waste disposal. And local bodies are asked to uh, about compost and, and to deal with uh, informal waste also. So state pollution control board SPCB also are asked about regulate interstate movements. Therefore, you we find out uh, an industrial units with 100 kilometers from the refuse derived fuel plant shall make arrangements to replace at least 5% of the fuel requirements by refused derived fuel. And by imposing these duties on the on various government departments, ministries, uh, there is a possibility of sustainable and pro proper use of power, compost and fuel generated, which are byproducts of this uh, waste management, waste management process. And it, le it also levy fines on people who, who litter in open spaces. So the manufacturers have got certain responsibilities, uh, developers of uh, economic zones, industrial estates, industrial parks, they got responsibilities. Waste generators are uh, restricted to dispose the waste on their own. So these are the salient features of solid waste management. So when we see this uh, plastic waste management. This rules also displaced an older rule that was uh, made in 2011. The significance of these rules are now local bodies, especially rural uh, local bodies are given a responsibility under this new rule. So you may seek under this uh, title responsibility of plastic producer, brand owner and local bodies. We see financial assistance from producer 
to set up waste managing management system may be done by local bodies so local bodies can ask and local bodies are responsible for proper plastic waste management system and performing associate functions and producers brand owners need to work out modalities for waste management collection system and now the responsibility of retailers and street vendors now the even the street vendors are given a responsibility to dispose the waste produced by them so the shopkeepers or street vendors willing to provide plastic carry bags for dispensing any commodity shall register with local body and now uh, as you know the amended rules strictly prohibit or reduce the use of plastic than what is being envisaged in the 2016 rules so so the current practice or the current regulations are very strict and it prohibits usage of plastic bags under many circumstances now we'll move on to e waste management rules 2016 so these rules uh, governs producers consumer or bulk consumer collection center dismantler and recycler the liability is extended to manufacturers and dealers also so the rules are applicable to various products such as electrical electronic equipments components consumables and spares cfl bulbs are brought under the new regulation now it has been a responsibility of the producers those who produce uh, e waste uh, they are supposed to collect it a collection of and then these rules are not applicable for waste generated that is hazardous and other waste management transboundary movement rules essentially talks about how to transport the hazardous substances and what is hazardous substances generally hazardous substances that are governed under water air act merchant shipping act atomic energy act because there is a separate or other regulation for it so hazardous substances are given under the schedule in the rules apart from whatever is given in the schedule there are other rules also dealing with hazardous substances those rules are those hazardous substances are not governed by this rule by the 2016 so what is hazardous waste hazardous waste means any waste which by reason of characteristics such as physical chemical biological toxic flammable explosive or corrosive causes danger or is likely to cause danger to health or environment whether alone or in contact with other waste or substances they are supposed to be disposed properly isn't it so the responsibilities are given to the occupier whoever is holding that waste so they are supposed to prevent minimize reuse recycle recovery of the waste so here the utilization of hazardous and other waste as a resource shall be carried out only after obtaining authorization from the state pollution control board since you are dealing with hazardous substance you need to get permission from the authorities because they give you a protective procedure as well as mechanism on how to deal with hazardous substances now uh, import and export of hazardous substances it's about transboundary movement and here you see something called as uh, basel convention basel convention is an international management rules if you have ever been to hospital obviously we are we are we have many times visited we have visited hospitals and we should have seen uh, a separate room or separate bags are maintained whenever they collect a uh, blood sample from you you might have noticed that the concerned technician is placing it in a separate bag why are they placing it because there is a requirement under the biomedical waste management rules that it should be properly disposed uh, these rules are specific about where and when and how these waste to be collected and disposed and these rules are applicable to whoever is generating waste who are all generating hospitals veterinary dispensaries research laboratories all of them are generating so it is applicable to all of them so now what is biomedical waste and it is the pro- during the process of diagnosis treatment whatever you get and that has been defined here in rule uh, 3f of the biomedical waste management rules and duties of the occupier what are the duties of the person who is having biomedical waste or she has to take all necessary steps to ensure that biomedical waste is handled without any adverse impact to the human health and the environment 
and these rules make a provision within the premises for a safe, ventilated and secure location for storage of segregated biomedical waste. That's why you see that hospitals mention specifically bags, hospitals, larger hospitals may have specifically allocated rooms for waste uh, disposal. So we'll see the battery waste management rules 2022 briefly. This is a new rule made in August 2022. These rules cover almost all types of batteries that we see today in electric vehicles, portable batteries, automotive batteries and industrial batteries. These rules adopt the concept of extended producer responsibility which you have seen already. So where the producers of batteries are responsible for collection and recycling, refurbishment of waste batteries and use of recovered materials from waste into new batteries. And the rules also mandate the minimum percentage of recovery of materials from waste batteries that is also provided. And it also provides for the use of certain number of recycled materials in making of new batteries. So that is for this lecture. Thanks for listening.